Good evening. My name is Nita Pepper and I'm Vice President of Institutional Advancement at the Wistar Institute. Tonight I'm going to start by asking our good friend Dr. Meinhard Herlin, Professor of Molecular and Cellular Oncogenesis and Director of the Wistar Institute Melanoma Cancer Center, to say a few words as we take a moment to pay tribute to two individuals who have played a major role in Wistar's melanoma research program. Meinhard, will you please join me? Um. I have been at the Wistar for um, uh, over 45 years, um, working on melanoma basically since then. And um, we thought we'd start with a little bit of a sad remembrance of two individuals who have made major contribution to melanoma and to melanoma research. The first is is uh, I always call her mother, and Eleanor Murdoch and uh, Larry Murdoch. Eleanor um, passed away last November, and uh, I have to uh, sadly say she's one of the 600,000 individuals we lost to COVID, and it was a real sad, um, uh, sad occurrence. And Eleanor is the mother of Noreen and Kate O'Neill. Noreen is the founder of the um, uh, Melanoma Research um, uh, Society and the uh, Melanoma Research Foundation uh, that we have started. And um, she started it initially together with Kate because she had already advanced melanoma. When she passed away, um, Kate took over, and um, and through all this uh, this these uh, terrible occurrences, um, Eleanor stood behind Kate and stood behind this new foundation, and she was the motor in the background. She was the contact um, uh, to the um, all the advocate groups. Um, she maintained the. Um, uh, the communications, but she also asked for contributions to the foundation. And Kate then um, helped us to organize the very first Melanoma Congress. And it is often said that this Congress um, was the beginning of modern melanoma research. Um, and um, this was backed up by um, Kate's husband, who who took care of the um, uh, numbers, he was a um, a financial person, and so um, we could do this and organize this um, uh, because of Eleanor's and and uh, Larry's support, and through all the countless hours of Kate. Um, doing um, uh, organizing this congress, so that was the start. And then at the same time, um, uh, Kate organized um, and, uh, the that we could st uh, start together with Marianne Berwick, uh, who is here tonight, the uh, Society for Melanoma Research. And this society is now the society in the field, and uh, meets every year and is the place to go, not just for researchers, but also for all the clinicians. It's uh, this year, it will be um, in New Orleans, it will be even in person, one can attend online. Um, uh, so, but it is an exciting event. This was started by, um, uh, by Kate uh, O'Neill, but then by mother, by Eleanor. And, um, uh, so I then want to move on to another very sad event because we lost um, our dearest colleague, we call him Sham. Um, Sham has been working at Wistar on melanoma since 1989 when he joined the laboratory of my wife Dorothy. And, um, and then when she retired 10, 12 years ago, uh, he came to my laboratory. His, he has over 100 research publications, but it is not so much the publications, it is the person. He had encyclopedic knowledge 
everybody went to him for questions in immunology and he was the person to go. He was a wonderful mentor to young people and um, he was also um, a very fair person in the laboratory. Uh, he suddenly, unexpectedly um, uh, died this February and it was a big shock to us and we still, I have to admit, we have not recovered. Um, but he will be remembered and um, he will be with us for the many, many years to come. Thank you so much and um, I hope you have a a really informative evening. Thank you, Meanhard. I'd like to now give my sincere thanks to the members of the Women in Science Program Committee, our sponsors that you will see on this slide, and all of you who generously supported this initiative in Wistar Science. I want to make a special call out to the melanoma survivors and the friends and families of those affected by melanoma who have been extraordinary supporters of Wistar's melanoma research including, as you've heard, Kate O'Neill, Eleanor Armstrong, and Pat Dean. I would also like to thank our incredible panel of speakers who participated virtually today as we celebrated Wistar's annual Noreen O'Neill Melanoma Research Scientific Symposium. Wistar is an international leader in biomedical tra training and research and is the home of breakthrough scientific discoveries in cancer, immunology, and infectious disease research. Our mission, as an independent research institute is to let our scientists focus solely on the science. We give our researchers financial support and a collaborative environment to make new discoveries in biomedical science, to push those discovery from the bench as therapies and solutions for people and thus improve human health. Wistar's Women in Science program highlights the crucial role that basic and clinical research play in addressing the scientific challenges related to women's health and showcases the distinguished and dynamic women behind the science. This evening program focused on melanoma is timely as we head into the summer months, hopefully full of fun time spent outdoors and in the sun. Melanoma is one of the most common forms of cancer, especially in young people. And sadly, one person dies of melanoma every hour of every day. The distinguished panel of researchers that we have presenting today are changing the way that we understand melanoma. Under the skilled moderation of Dr. Maureen Murphy, the Ira Brin Professor and Program Leader of the Molecular and Cellular Oncogenesis Program at the Wistar Institute, you will hear how their labs are exploring ways to prevent and treat melanoma. In addition to Dr. Murphy, today's panel will include in alphabetical order, Dr. Noam Oslander, who's Wistar's most recent superstar recruit and an assistant professor in the Molecular and Cellular Oncogenesis Program, Dr. Marianne Berwick, Distinguished Professor, Department of Internal Medicine, Division of Epidemiology and Associate Director of Cancer Population Services of the University of New Mexico Comprehensive Cancer Center, Dr. Chen Yu Lang, Professor in the Molecular and Cellular Oncogenesis Program at Wistar, and Dr. Justine Villanueva, Associate Professor, Molecular and Cellular Oncogenesis Program at Wistar. Please note that all of you will be muted during today, tonight's program. And if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat section or the question section, and we will answer them as, as many as we can this evening. And if we don't get to them, we're, we'll follow up with email and make sure that we get your questions answered. So with that, I would like to now turn the evening over to Maureen and this wonderful panel. And uh, thank you all again for joining us. Thank you so much, Anita. So if the panel can show themselves, we would love to see you. Um, we're gonna start really basic. Um, Mary Ann Berwick, I'd love to ask you the question, can you set the stage for us? What is melanoma and how is it caused? And why do rates seem to be increasing so much these days? Thank you for that question. And um, I'm looking forward to sharing that information. Okay, so um, melanoma is a tumor of melanocytes. Melanocytes are at the basement membrane of the skin. They're lower in the skin than the um, basal cells and squamous cells. Um, and they're generally fairly distant from each other. Uh, many of us have what are called nevi or moles. And a mole is simply an accumulation of melanocytes. And the reason that nevi are so associated with melanoma is because sometimes these 
uh, break through the basement membrane and go into the deeper dermis and lead to melanoma. However, melanoma can start without a nevus. It can start um, all by itself in situ. So normal skin is pictured here and a nevus is pictured here. So I wanna talk a little bit about the incidence of melanoma. And what you see here is um, female incidence in the red and the green. The green is um, females from 1997 to 1999. And then just in 10 years, from 2007 to 2009, it increased, but as you see, not as much as men. So here we go, here are the men from 1997 to 1999, and here are the men increasing again from 2007 to 2009. There are lots of reasons for this, and I will try to um, mention at least one of them. One reason for an increase in melanoma incidence is that we now wear many fewer clothes when we're at the beach. So it used to be in the early 1900s that people wear hats and long sleeves and um, clothes sort of covering most of their body. And here in 2000, you can see what goes on at the Riviera. Um, it's a beautiful scene, but uh, people are in danger here. Um, let's see. Let's I'm afraid it doesn't want to go forward. Okay, a second reason for increased melanoma incidence is that the biopsy rates have um, gone sky high. So um, they have increased over time um, from maybe 100 uh, per 100,000 or 10, 000, yeah, 100,000, all the way up to 200 per 100,000. They're going down just a little bit, but um, once there was um, information about the dangers of melanoma, um, your primary care physician started worrying more about it and would send you to a dermatologist and it was easy to just make a biopsy. But if you look for something, you're much more likely to find it. And this is true with biopsy rates. A third reason is that we're spending more time indoors. And well, how does that help us? Well, I have more melanoma. The problem is that this leads to intermittent sun exposure. It's the intermittent sun exposure that is the most dangerous for leading to mutations in melanoma. In fact, people don't realize this, but people who are outdoors all the time tend to develop um, a little bit of protection with a little thicker skin and a little bit of tan. But people who are indoors most of the time, like those of us who work indoors, and then also um, young people are now um, having a lot of fun indoors. And so when they do go out, they are much more likely to get sunburned. And blistering sunburns come from intermittent sun exposure, not from um, consistent sun exposure. And they're, whether they're in children or adults, they're definitely a risk factor for melanoma. Then here we see a group of young children that were pictured in Washington, D.C. by National Geographic. And they're lined up according to risk. So the very light-skinned um, young people with, with light hair, light eyes, and skin that freckles and doesn't tan very easily um, versus people with darker skin, darker eyes, and darker hair, um, there's different levels of risk for melanoma. And let me just show you an example. So um, you can see here that very light skin um, in, might uh, become uh, dangerous after 14 minutes without protection the minimal erythemal dose, the minimal dose that it requires to turn your skin red would be 14 minutes. Whereas somebody with darker skin would be um, almost three times that or 10 times that. So it's very important for you to understand your own skin tone and be aware of what can happen with the interaction with sun exposure. Now, one thing that we um, think is really, really important is to be on the lookout for um, the A, B, C, Ds of melanoma. And here are pictures of benign um, nevi and malignant melanoma. So you look for asymmetry, that is an odd outline. You look for border irregularity. Um, you look for color. So there are color differences in melanoma. Some have pink in the middle, some have dark uh, brown, black. And then the diameter, um, we used to use pencils. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's using them anymore. We say that if, um, a, um, if, if the diameter is greater than that of a pencil eraser, it could be a melanoma because that's unusual in a mole. And so what we want people to do is self-screen. 
be on the lookout in you and your spouse for unusual spots, changing spots. And there's another um, E has been added to this enlarging spots. So um, we're trying now in our study um, to not only look for skin screening, but to look at tumors of people from different parts of the world and try to find out characteristics of the tumors that might make a, show us that a person is less likely to um, die from melanoma and which people are more likely to die from melanoma. And then we think that that might help with the, um, with, with our current rates of melanoma. We have um, 16 different centers participating in this intermel study. So I hope that answers your questions, Maureen. Um, and please always enjoy the sun, but safely cover up. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, now we're going to turn to um, Dr. Liang. Cheng Yu, can you tell us a little bit about how melanoma is treated and then uh, maybe add a little bit about how WISTAR has contributed to this research and um, a little bit about your own research? Yeah, thanks, Maureen, and thanks all of you for coming today. And I hope to be able to share with you some information um, about melanoma treatment. So over the last decade, we have seen how science and technology make such dramatic change in therapy options that have really changed the life of patients with melanoma, particularly those with advanced and metastatic melanoma. So the reason I said that is because if you could identify melanoma in the very early stage, the option for treatment is very simple, fast, and curative just take that lesion out. So that's why, as Maureen just described, that the doctors have developed this very friendly ABCDE classics for us to self-examine our skin and to identify the warning signs of this disease at the early stage. So if you have a mole on your body that had changed the color, the shape, or been growing, you certainly need to go to your doctors or dermatologists to consider a biopsy. But if the early signs are missed, the disease starts to grow out of the skin, out of the lymph node, and even spread throughout the body, and we call it advanced or metastatic melanoma. And then the treatment plan suddenly becomes very tricky and complicated, and the survival rate also plummets. So that's why we always see that the prevention and early detection is the best and the most cost-effective treatment always, particularly for cancers like melanoma. So prior to 2011, patients who had gotten melanoma that spread to other parts of their body had a very small chance of ever surviving five years. Many of them just died within a few months. It's like a death sentence. So we had only two approved medicines for this patient. One was a chemotherapy drug and the other was IL-2. None of them worked well. It could only benefit up to 5% of patients. So scientists started to look at what's going on with melanoma, why it's so stubborn to treat. So the turning point began with two breakthrough discoveries. Firstly, it was found that the immune system in the patient with melanoma that's supposed to kill melanoma is not working as expected. Why it's not working? If you look at the left panel, our immune system is like the shepherd. Its duty is to keep sheep protected. Melanoma is like the wolf. So the wolf is in the flock, but the shepherd couldn't see it because a wolf is wearing a sheep's skin. What the new medicine does is to train the shepherd to get smarter, work harder, and give shepherd the tool to recognize this disguised wolf. And then now your immune cells can recognize your melanoma cells and attack them. This is what's so-called immunotherapy. That is to have your body attack your cancer autonomous, autonomously. It's a more durable treatment. The side effect of it is that you might run some risk of autoimmune or inflammatory spontaneous inf inflammation, such as colitis. Because now you have your shepherd, your immune system going bananas. So they could sometimes 
take a real ship as a wolf and attack it by mistake. Another big discovery is that we found that in approximately 50%, it's a big number, right? 50% of melanoma patients, the melanoma tumor cells contains a mutation in a gene called BRAF. This mutation drives the melanoma cells crazy. It keeps telling cells, keep growing, keep moving, keep spreading. It's like a car that its gas pedal is broken. So the driver loses the control of the car's speed. If you could block this signal, it actually can be very effective to shut down the activities of melanoma cells. So now we have developed this medicine. It's actually a pill that specifically targets this mutation and cuts off the signal. Once the signal is terminated, melanoma cells run out of gas. So they slow down and eventually stop. This is what's so-called targeted therapy because it targets a specific gene or mutation in cancers. It has become a very effective therapy for patients who have a BRAF mutation. So I really want to comment that Wistar has been the really the front runner in melanoma targeted therapy. Wistar Melanoma Cell Bank is instrumental in the discovery of the driver mutation in BRAF. And the first studies using BRAF inhibitors against the melanoma were actually done in Dr. Minghart Herding's lab here at Wistar. So we're very proud of it. The challenge of this therapy is that cancer cells would get smarter and they learn how to hop over this mutation and the bad hands the drug target and keep their increasing mode of growth. That's why in addition to BRAF inhibitors, we now have developed other targeted therapy such as MAC inhibitor, even ERK inhibitor, working on the same signaling pathway. So when used together with a BRAF inhibitor, for some patients, it could achieve long-term remission. So nowadays, for people who have advanced or metastatic melanoma, half of them will get targeted therapy, some will get immunotherapy, and some will get combination therapy. That means one targeted therapy combined with the other targeted therapy, or one immunotherapy combined with other immunotherapies, or a hybrid combination. So with these new treatment options, we could now have at least 50% of our patient, no more 5%, 50% of our patients survive and have their disease controlled. And some of them could really achieve very long-term remission. So this is really amazing. The current challenge for us is that you know, 50% is not equivalent to 100%, right? So we also need to figure out what is the right therapy to be used uh, for the right patient at the right time. Why the therapy works in some, but not in others. So the core research that we're working hard on is that we try to have, uh, try to develop a test or biomarkers that can be used to say, hey, you know, this marker looks very high and we think you might be good for immunotherapy or combination treatment. For patients who have a BRAF inhibitor, we're starting hard on the mechanism that could be manipulated to put additional roadblock to stop this crazy car, to increase the efficacy of BRAF inhibitors and to make the patient response as durable as possible. So we still have a lot of to learn, but we are full of hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheng Yu. That was a wonderful response. You talk about tumor cells becoming smart, and that's always our worry. When are they going to get smart and become resistant? And we have one of the leaders in drug resistance in melanoma here, Dr. Jesse Villanueva. Jesse, can you tell us a little bit about um, your research on therapy resistance and some of your excitement about some of the new therapies that are being uh, explored and developed in your lab? Sure, Maureen. Thank you so much for that question. And I'm really glad to be here, have the opportunity to share this panel with my colleagues today and with you, of course. Um, so as uh, we heard from Jen Yu, this has been a really exciting time for the melanoma field. We have new therapies, novel approaches, novel treatments to help melanoma patients. 
but we're dealing still with a big challenge, and that is therapy resistance. So it's one, in fact, it's one of the biggest challenges we face for successful treat, uh, treatment of cancer. And not only for melanoma, it's virtually for every type of cancer. So broadly speaking, there are three types of drug resistance. One is primary or intrinsic drug resistance. And that is basically when tumors are completely indifferent to drugs, they don't respond to treatment. We then have what we call adaptive drug resistance. And that is when tumors can respond, but they are so plastic that they very easily rewire and find a way to bypass the effects of the drugs. Um, and then finally, we can talk also about secondary or acquired drug resistance. And that is when treatment initially works great. We see uh, amazing responses. Sometimes even tumors shrink, patients get much better. But because tumors are highly heterogeneous, there are always a subset of cells that escape treatment. Those cells then can remain asleep for a while. And then when the conditions are right, they can reawaken and then lead to tumor relapse and tumor regrowth. Um, so that's a big challenge for the field. That's why we're working hard to understand the potential mechanisms that these tumor cells use to escape therapy. That way we can develop better treatments to overcome or delay the emergence of resistance. So in fact, one of the tumor types that is highly resistant to therapy are those that are driven by NRAS mutations. So NRAS is a small protein that acts as a molecular switch. Um, under normal physiological conditions, NRAS acts as an antenna that senses biochemical or molecular signals, then interpret those signals, and then transmits them through what we call a signaling cascade which is then finally interpreted by the cells as a direction to um, either grow, proliferate, or divide. So when RAS is mutated, then that molecular switch is broken and it stays in an on position. What that, um, what that causes is that RAS constitutively or permanently signals the cells to proliferate aberrantly to proliferate indefinitely, and therefore um, leads to, uh, gives them the opportunity to accumulate additional mutations and eventually result in uh, melanoma. These tumors that have NRAS mutations account for approximately 25 to 30 percent of all melanomas. They're highly resistant to treatment. There are limited therapies to treat patients with NRAS mutations. They're extremely aggressive. They have high propensity to metastasize to distant organs, including the brain. And so this is one area that my lab is um, very interested in and focusing on. And we are trying to identify and develop ways that we can target these NRAS mutant tumors or these tumors that are driven by NRAS. Now, the conventional way to target a tumor is to inhibit or to block the driver. In this case, mutant NRAS would be the driver. Sometimes that is not possible, and this is in fact the case for NRAS mutant tumors. Despite significant efforts for the past 30 years, we still don't have a drug that can directly target RAS. So what we're doing is we're trying to find alternative ways or alternative pathways to block the growth and the survival of these tumors. Now, these, uh, finding these alternative pathways or these uh, critical molecules that are essential for the survival of the tumors, um, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's not as straightforward and we have to face a number of challenges. So let me give you an example. We have identified one molecule that is called SSK2 that is essential for the survival of these NRAS mutant tumors. We have found that if we silence or we inhibit this molecule, then these tumors cannot survive. We have characterized the mechanism whereby this SSK2 controls the survival of these NRAS mutant tumors. Um, but the challenge that we face is that there are no drugs to selectively inhibit SSK2. So our team decided to have taken a number of different approaches, and we decided to embark in a new adventure. 
and that is to try to develop new drugs that can selectively block SSK2, induce a specific cell death in the tumors without causing any toxicity to normal cells. Of course, to do that, we need to have adequate resources, we need to have tools, um, state-of-the-art technology, and the right models. And we're very fortunate to be at the Western Institute where we have really state-of-the-art core facilities that have the right tools, the right technology to embark into this adventure. And on top of that, we have really, um, uh, really sophisticated models that we can use in the lab to study the effects of these drugs and the biology of Andras mutant melanoma, mimicking what is going to happen in a real tumor within a patient. In addition to these tools and resources, this is a teamwork, this is a team effort. No one person can do this on its own. So we're very lucky to be at Wistar where we have faculty that has diverse skills and diverse backgrounds and knowledge. And so we have put together a team that is composed not only by cancer biologists like us in the panel today, but also includes other investigators that have expertise in proteomics, for example, structural biologists and chemists. And we all together have put our heads to think about what is the best way to target this protein and develop new drugs. So I'm happy to report that we have now a good tool compound that we think is going to be very promising to target this protein that I'm giving you as an example. And together, we will reach this goal of disabling these tumors and hopefully overcome drug resistance. Thank you so much, Jesse. We're going to turn now to our newest recruit in the MCO program, Dr. Noam Auslander. I was so thrilled when she agreed to come to Wistar. She's done amazing work asking the question, who will respond to different therapies? And Noam, you have very novel strategies to talk about who will respond, but also to break treatment resistance. Can you tell us a little bit about what's novel about the approaches that you use uh, to target melanoma? So uh, the, before I describe what are the strategies that we, I work on uh, to try to combat treatment resistance, in general, I would say that uh, my, my research is a little different from other people in the panel because what I do, is, it's purely computational, and what I do is that I look at some publicly available data sets and some data sets from collaborators. I analyze those data sets using computational techniques, and I come up with the research questions that I want to ask, and then I, I try to find a solution for those research questions. So now how do we use these data sets and the computational techniques trying to overcome treatment resistance and to find new ways to overcome treatment resistance? So can you move um, to the next slide, please, uh, Eric? Thank you. So one of the ways that we can do it is by uh, building predictors for treatment responses. So we can use different data sets and try to predict which patients will respond to the treatment and which patients will be resistant. And by doing that, we can spare patients that are unlikely to respond from the treatment and reduce the resistance rate by, by treating patients more accurately. And the second thing that uh, can, can come up of that is that by predicting, by building predictors that predict which patients are more likely to respond, we can also find what could be the next drug targets. We can find what, what correlates with treatment response and resistance and find new drug targets to, to, to treat the patients that are, that are resistant to the treatment. So this is one way that we can analyze large-scale data sets to try to find uh, solutions and to, to, to alleviate treatment resistance. And the other ways that we are working on is by, uh, if you can switch to the next slide, so thank you. So this is by studying cancer evolution. And we can use the same large scale data sets to try to un understand how cancer evolves. So cancer is an evolutionary process. Cancer evolves from, from the normal cells uh, to the, by accumulation of different mutations over time, and eventually, which eventually lead to the advanced stages and metastasis. And by understanding this process and using different data sets, we can understand what happens during this process. By understanding this process, we can find new ways to battle resistance. So if you can just move to the to, to, through the next to the end of the slide, because these are yeah. 
So I will do it without the without the steps. So one of the one example uh, of how the question is how by understanding how cancer evolves, how can we understand how can we find new ways to to overcome resistance? So this is one example. Uh, one thing that happens in cancer is the loss of DNA repair. We have in our cells different processes that are called DNA that are called DNA repair, and these processes are supposed to repair damage that is caused to our DNA by different factors. For one example is the UV radiation, it causes damage to the DNA and our DNA repair processes should repair this damage. And one of the things that happen in cancer is the loss of this DNA repair, which leads to uh, accumulation of mutations because with the loss of DNA repair, we accumulate a lot of damage to the DNA, which causes many mutations. Eventually, this would cause accelerated growth and cancer. So this sounds like a bad thing. A loss of DNA repair can lead to many mutations, accelerated growth and cancer. But on the other hand, the same thing, the loss of the DNA repair also introduces vulnerability. So for example, one of the example, one example that I can give is that the loss of DNA repair can create more, can, can generate vulnerability, uh, induce vulnerability to different treatments. And one of the treatments, one example is radiation therapy. So there are different treatments that are generating damage and breaks in the DNA, and one of them is radiation therapy. This uh, radiation therapy generate, uh, induces breaks to our DNA. So what happens is if, if we are treated, if we are treating healthy cells with radiation therapy, those cells have active DNA repair, and they can repair the damage that is caused by the treatment. But in contrast to that, if we are treating cancer cells with the, with treatment that is uh, like radiation therapy that is inducing breaks to the DNA, cancer cells cannot repair this damage and they will more selectively die. So this is one example of how by understanding what happens in cancer evolution and by analyzing large-scale data set, we can understand what are the mutations and processes that lead to the, to the drive the cancer evolution, we can find what pathways or what, or what alterations and what mutations can sensitize uh, tumors to different treatments, and we can find new ways to overcome treatment resistance. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Noam. So panel, we have five brilliant women working on this problem, this difficult smart tumor. Um, Mary and Berwick, I'd like to ask you, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge moving forward for the melanoma field? Well, um, actually, I thought a lot about that. And one problem that um, is not just restricted to melanoma, but um, all of our science. And, and I think that um, what we need to do is be able to consistently replicate our findings so that if one lab finds something, another lab needs to replicate it in slightly different circumstances. And I think we've heard that that hasn't happened as much as we would like it. We really need basic science discoveries in order to help move forward um, the, the, the treatments, but they have to be replicated or else we're just wasting our time. Dr. Villanueva, what makes you hopeful that melanoma will be cured in our lifetime? What are you hopeful about? So, Definitely, as I mentioned earlier, this has been the past 10 years we have made tremendous progress treating melanoma. I think we are at the point where we can leverage um, our knowledge, um, our resources and our technology, um, something that we didn't have in the past. Nowadays, as no one was mentioned, we can use computational biology to analyze data, big data sets, and then get better information, newer treatment approaches. So I think definitely we are at the verge of, of breaking the disease. We think we have made significant advances. We now can seek some cures. Definitely there are still lots of things to do, a lot more work to do. We need to focus on those rare types of melanomas, um, the NRA subsets, the triple wild type subsets, those that have limited treatment options. But I think that you know, recruiting more and more scientists into the field, we will be getting there very soon. Completely agree. And your research is going to move us forward. 
Um, I'm going to now turn to Dr. Cheng Yu Liang. Cheng Yu, you are a highly accomplished scientist. Can you sort of think about and share um, one thing that you think has been key to your success so far? Okay, thanks, Maureen. Uh, thanks for your comment. So I want to say three key words uh, that I think are important um, for my career, actually for my life too. So they are um, passion, perseverance, and commitment. So um, I don't think I have the highest IQ for this job. No, I don't think so. But I'm very <laughs> passionate about doing science and I'm easily excited about a small piece of discoveries in my lab. And um, so uh, my age is growing, but I think my heart stays young because of science, because science always makes me feel like a humble student in the face of the profound beauty and the profound mystery of life. So, um, so I do have had some dark time and desperate moment in my career and my life too. And I never thought about giving up, never ever. And I think that's prob probably because I have a strong commitment to this job. That is to discover the truth of life. Life means my life, your life, and everyone's life. So stay hungry, stay foolish. That works. Thank you. I love it. I'm going to stay hungry too. Uh, Dr. Berwick, do you want to weigh in? What has been key to your success so far? Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, it builds on what Cheng Yi has to say. Um, I, through my research, I faced some difficulties, um, I, and and I was able to overcome them. And that gave me a lot of self-confidence that I could do what I wanted. And um, by just moving forward, and as you say, having passion and commitment, it, it has made a big difference. Um, I, I don't think I either am the most brilliant person <laughs> um, doing my work, but I think that um, I have been fully funded for a long time. And um, so persistence seems to be the key and also knowing your strength. Oh, I like that too, persistence and knowing your strength. Um, all right, so we're gonna turn to um, some questions that were posed by the audience. Um, Jesse Villanueva, we know that there's many different kinds of melanoma, and we talk about mostly skin cutaneous, but there are other kinds that can be even more aggressive that are not UV-induced, like mucosal, acral, uveal, can you tell us a little bit about where we are, for example, um, how are these tumor types different? And where are we with regard to cures for these other subtypes of melanoma? Sure, Maureen, thank you so much for that question. So um, everything that we've been talking about so far uh, relates mainly to cutaneous melanoma, which is the, the type of melanoma that happens in the melanocytes in the skin that Marianne very nicely explained to us. Um, but there are other types of melanomas that happen in places, as you mentioned, that sometimes do not see or do, are not exposed to sand, such as the uh, wet mucosals. Um, acral, which happens mainly in the palms of our hands or in the um, soles of our feet. And those are very rare types of melanomas. Um, and because they're rare, they're also very different. The mutations that we find in cutaneous melanoma not always happens in these rare types, and we haven't made much progress in those. Um, some of the limitations are the fact that because they're rare, there are very few cell lines and models to work with. Um, also, Unfortunately, because there are few uh, patients that uh, have these types, there's not been a lot of funding devoted to uh, pr pursue research in this area. So there's tons of things that we need to do. Um, I'm very happy that um, the field has now started to pay more attention to these rare subtypes of melanomas. Um, they're now creating um, registries of patients and so in order to collect information and collect uh, cell lines and tissue samples that we can now start working on. Um, so that is coming uh, down the road. We're hoping to also get more people encouraged to work in these subtypes of melanomas because there's 
tons to do. What do we have so far? Unfortunately, not much, not really many approved therapies. So immunotherapy, of course, is probably at the front line. Um, it doesn't work very well for all subtypes. Um, there are some cases like UBL melanoma where we now have biospecific fusion proteins that have been designated as breakthrough therapies right now. So these are molecules that bring together T cells to the UBL cells in order to attack them directly. So that's something that it's in the pipeline and should be approved pretty soon or we expect approval pretty soon. For mucosal melanoma, um, also immunotherapy has been tested, but there's nothing approved yet. Um, there are some mutations that we can go after, for example, CKIT, and we have drugs to target CKIT. So that could be an option for mucosal melanoma. And for ACRAL, there is absolutely nothing at this point. So that's something that we, we have to work on when we have to identify new targets. Thank you. I certainly do see that these rare subtypes are becoming more popular as we have success with cutaneous. More and more researchers that have been successful are now driving into those rarer subtypes. And so we should expect to see great things in the next five to 10 years. Uh, I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Cheng Yu Liang, and, and talk about everybody's usually interested in yes, we know that you know there are targeted therapies and there's immunotherapy, but there are also other things that people can do. For example, Fasting is something that's been talked about uh, for many different cancers as uh, potentially being um, uh, not curative, certainly, but um, you know, as helpful. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, fasting and, and how it can maybe work synergistically with therapies uh, for melanoma and other tumors? Certainly. Uh, thanks, Marie. So, uh, so we know that the fasting and uh, calorie restriction have been shown both experimentally and in clinical trials to be able to slow down and even stop the progression of cancers. So it could kill cancer cells and boost the immune system and significantly improve the effectiveness of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So there are some interesting studies showing that if you could do uh, about 12 hour fasting every day for about 30 days, you will find that you can rewire your genetic program by um, upregulating or turning on those genes that actually seriously damage your cancer by turning off those genes that could promote your cancer. So it's, it's just great. And fasting also being shown could boost your immune system, particularly the, 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 the killer T cells and NK cells, their job is just to kill cancers. So you're gonna have a strong T cell immunity um, so another mechanism that uh, fasting can, uh, can really work is through the stimulation of the autophagy program, which is actually one of the focus of my own research. So autophagy is a self-cleaning mechanism, a program of cells. It's actually in every type of cells, everyone has it. So it serves, to, it serves as a self-cleaning mechanism to clean up all the intracellular trash such as damaged proteins, might come, you know, damaged organelles, so just to make it, give the cells a clean internal environment. So, um, so we found that, we did a very interesting study. We found that if you could mimic the strong fasting mode of cells by switching on the entire autophagy lysosome program, it has shown experimentally it could remarkably slow down the melanoma progression it could prevent the tumor metastasis and even increase the efficacy of melanoma targeted therapy. So I think if you are a cancer patient, intermittent fasting will be a very simple, cheaper, and a flexible way to help you manage your life and fight against the cancer. But you certainly want to do it under the guidance of your doctors or nutrition specialist, right? So um, I think it's a great way uh, for cancer patients to try. Thank you, Marie. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask this question to Dr. Berwick. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the role of education and prevention in skin cancer? Um, what role does education really play? You, you've obviously you know, pioneered education. Can you tell me about the role of education in preventing skin cancer? Sure. I think I showed a slide where we had a little leopard with spots looking at someone else's spots. And we actually made a video many years ago, I think, from um, the uh, marine uh, 
Melanoma Foundation. <laughs> I think they funded it. Um, and um, it's really, really, really important to know your own body, as um, Chengyi was saying, and know your spots to be able to identify a changing mole. And there are apps out that where you can take pictures of your own moles and then look to see over time if they have changed. And I have used that myself. Um, I had an old age spot, a seborrhea keratosis, and it was, it was great because I saw that it hadn't changed, but it was still there and I was worried about it. So I went to see my dermatologist and she said, no, no, it's okay. But uh, so I think the most important thing is to know your own skin. Um, and I think uh, one thing that I wanted to say um, about education for people who are um, maybe already have melanoma is I, I hope that Noam will put up a website where she will put her latest findings about the new therapies and where we can go to you, Noam, and find out how to best take care of ourselves if we already have melanoma. So thank you. It's all on you, Noam. You're just going to have to take the field. Well, if anybody can do it, you can do it. Um, so Noam, since I have you, um, can you tell me a little bit, you know, you're at the start of your career. Um, any advice for women who are just starting in graduate school? What do you, what do you know now that you wish you had known uh, years ago when you were starting out? I wish I had known probably um, so that I think that the choosing what to work on uh, is a is a major is a major part but choosing choosing the people who you work with is sometimes more important so not insisting on on the what's most interesting for you but finding the things that you are the best at and finding the people that you like working with the most. So this is something, you know, you, you naturally want to work on the one thing that is most interesting to you. And it's not always the right call for me, at least, yeah. I think that's great advice. And it, it echoes what Dr. Berwick talked about, knowing yourself. Dr. Pepper is here. Yeah. Anita, do you have some questions from the chat or do you want to weigh in here? Well, I really just wanted to take a minute to say thank you to this incredible panel of women scientists who are changing the course of, of human health. Um, as you see, we have epidemiologists, we have computational biologists, we have cancer basic researchers, and um, it just shows, as, as they've said tonight, what a team effort it is, and this is how science is done. And I think especially in this last year, as the public has gotten this incredible view of what science is like and what discovery can do, I think, you know, hopefully there's more importance, there's more funding, there's more resources and more of what we need to, to move this field forward. So um, really, I wanted to just say thank you to all of you for every day of what you do, um, for being so committed and perseverant and doing it for the benefit of humankind. Um, and thank you, Maureen, for moderating. And I wanted to say that our next Women in Science program will be September 23rd. Um, and that will be from five to six, and it will be Dr. Liz Jaffe of Johns Hopkins, who will be talking about immune therapy and pancreatic cancer. So it should be another really exciting uh, Women in Science program. And I hope you all will join us then. And for now, if you have any other follow-up questions, please just send me an email. I'll make sure that Maureen or Marianne or Noam or Jesse or Cheng Yu get the questions and we get them appropriately answered. So, so with that, I say thank you to all of you and uh, I hope that everybody has a good night. Thank you, ladies. And thank you, Anita, for organizing this amazing seminar series. Kudos. Thanks, everyone. Be Thank safe. You. Be well. Thank you.